morning. I'm so excited to be here tonight. I know it shouldn't be the most exciting part of my night, but in 1993, for Halloween, I was Madonna in the Blonde Ambition Tour, and I had a microphone just like this as part of my Halloween. I won't return to that event, because it won't be exactly what we should return to tonight. So tonight, I'm really excited to talk to you tonight about finding motivation in relationships and how that relates to the power you can you, you have to transform some really amazing things. So my presentation is called point one of an hour versus 1.0 of a life. I want to explore that with you. I didn't do PowerPoint slides and I didn't do them for a good reason. The last time I did PowerPoint slides it was at the Lethbridge Public Library, and I had the assistance of my nephew, who is incredibly technologically advanced. And my nephew put everything together for me and managed to spell public without the L. <laughs> <laughs> it was an awkward start, so we won't be too <laughs> So my name is Kristen. I am 40 years old, and I practice law here in Lethbridge. And you should be really nervous hearing that information. You should be thinking, oh my gosh, it's a lawyer, the last speaker of the night. This is not good. They love mics and they love to hear their own voice. But I promise I'll get you out at the right amount of time so that we can share ideas afterwards. But what I wanted to uh, share with you tonight is, uh, I wanna recall with you, I wanna explore with you the stereotype associated with lawyers. Because if money were no object, my God, lawyers have that mastered, right? <laughs> What's the stereotype out there about lawyers? Well, you've just met me, so clearly the stereotype is that we're ridiculously attractive, articulate, <laughs> brilliantly intuitive people. No? That's not the stereotype? What's the stereotype? The stereotype of lawyers is that we are pursuing money at the expense of all relationships that money is the object, that we're ridiculously belligerent, that we're argumentative, that we will exploit people's vulnerabilities to maximize one person's success. This is the stereotype that we have about lawyers, and yet, and to some degree, I wouldn't say it's entirely undeserved, well, obviously not for me, <laughs> but I, I put that stereotype out there to explore with you how I have changed the way I approach my professional career and how that has translated into oodles of differences and awesome experiences in my personal life. So, in order to get a sense of where I think relationships matter relative to and finding your motivation in relationships and how the success you can have in that, I think we have to have a little bit of background. And right now you should be really nervous. The minute a lawyer proposes that we have background, <laughs> you're like, oh my god, a book's going to come out. She's going to tell us to turn to page 3,000 and start reading to page 5,000. So they're not going to do that. So the background I'm going to share with you is about how I got to where I got, or where I got to where I am, and where, as Cheryl reminds me, got to where we should be. <laughs> so, uh, I was your normal high school kid. Normal in the sense that I was in the high school band and I was on the team and I had a car and I went on dates and I did what kids do, right? I had a normal high school life. But I was bored with a capital B. I tell you, I could not, for the life of me, when I was in high school, find any measure of motivation to figure out what to do. I had no sense whatsoever about what I was supposed to do. I was getting all sorts of advice. People would tell me, you should do something that interests you. Really? I'm interested in the royal family and expensive French cheeses. I mean, I don't see a lot of job opportunities coming available for those. Um, and, and when we'd have this, these talks, my mom would always do the exact same thing. <laughs> she would tilt her head in such a measure that I, I knew that I was supposed to have a different answer than I did, but I'm not about to lie and say I have a plan that I don't. So 
to please my parents and only to please my parents. I registered for university. I wasn't accepted until the day before. My parents dropped me off at university the, the first day of classes, because, which was bright and early, because that was the only kinds of classes that were still available. And um, apparently my mom cried all the way home on the west side. And my dad said to her, why are you crying? She'll call in a half hour to come pick her up. Asking us to come pick her up. They didn't think I would stay. So I went to university. And I had absolutely no interest in being there. But something really strange happened. Somewhere between 8 in the morning and 5 in the evening, learning about the history of economics in the Ukraine, or animal behavior, and then learning about how Mickey Mouse became more man, less mouse over time, <laughs> I, I developed a relationship with the ideas that I was learning, and something really triggered. For the first time in my entire life, I started to do well. And I started to be engaged with what, with what I was thinking about. And I started being engaged with the people who were teaching me. And that experience caused me to be so excited to continue to learn. So I finished my, my undergrad degree, and I decided I'm going to want to do my master's. I love this thing called thinking. Oh, this is so brilliant. <laughs> and so I registered for my master's, and oh my gosh, it was like being back in high school again, <laughs> I was turbo bored. In fact, the most memorable experience I had in my graduate career is that my office roommate came back at Christmas one year and said, I said, hi, Teresa, and she goes, actually, I don't want you to call me that anymore. Um, I realized over the Christmas holidays that my name has an H in it, so it's Theresa. <laughs> so the only thing I remember about grad school is having to remember this woman's name every single time I saw her. So I went to grad school, I finished grad school, and I knew I had to do something tangible because continuing on with this ideas wasn't going anywhere. I felt, I felt like I was shoveling clouds. So I went, to, I went uh, to law school, and while I was at law school, I had an amazing job. It was an absolutely fantastic job. I worked as a liaison worker for an organization called Crossroads in Edmonton, and it's a prostitute intervention service. And what I would do for months on end in the minus brutally cold weather, I would drive around in this gigantic purple van slash bus and work with people like the police, like the sex trade workers, like John's, and attempt to reduce the harm that these people were experiencing in their industry. And it was the most rewarding job. Oh my God, I could care less practically to be at law school. I was really, really excited about what we would do with law. There was ways that we were going to transform people's lives, that we were going to change their existence, that we were going to improve their world. And so I had this tangible relationship with what I was learning you know, relative to what I was doing. And it was really, really motivating. So you couldn't have imagined how motivated I was when I became a lawyer. <laughs> I'm changing the world. <laughs> really, there was nothing that could stop me. So I went to Lethbridge, and I started to change the world, or at least that I, that's what I thought I was going to do. But I found myself doing things like determining what a broken hip was worth. Hmm, I didn't feel like I was changing the world very much. Um, I was determining whether or not uh, you could register security in a movable asset, like an airplane. Hmm, not really changing the world. Um, I was learning, I, I think this is funny, I was reflecting upon this yesterday. I was learning about whether or not this very new, innovative kind of technology called call display was, uh, <laughs> that's how old I am. Uh, was whether or not that could be admissible as hearsay evidence. Or so this, this is the kinds of things I was doing. And I began to have that exact same feeling again. That feeling I felt exactly in high school. Bored. Bored. I was terribly bored. But then one day, my employer came to me, my boss came to me and said, Kristen, we have a conference. We need for you to go. We paid for the registration, and there's no one to go. 
okay, yeah, I can go. It's a conference, Kristen, all about motivating employees, getting the most out of your workers. And I thought right away, my inside voice was thinking, oh my God, they are aware that I was planning an office rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> They're worried about my motivation. They're sending me there for a reason. I picked the state where I picked for a reason. So um, I, I was quite nervous to go to this conference thinking it was a reflection of my effort when it really wasn't. But sad or great thing, however you want to describe it, I went to this conference and it was all about learning how to motivate your staff. I didn't learn how to motivate anyone around me, but instead I learned all about my motivation. And what I learned in this conference, through a whole bunch of psychobabble exercises, I can't about, I'm not about to explain them, I learned that I was primarily motivated by relationships. Relationships were what put the fuel in my tank. And it was so obvious what someone was able to explain to me why I was motivated to do what I did. And I look back, I realize that's why my undergrad experience was so rewarding. It's because I had a relationship with what I was learning. It, it held promise. I had relationships with my teachers. And that's why grad school was so, well, <laughs> unmotivating, <laughs> right? Because I did have that relationship. And when I look at my work when I was working at Crossroads, it's exactly it. It was all relationship-based. And so I quickly realized that if I wanted to have any success in my career, I had to design it entirely and nearly exclusively around relationships. Which, it seems kind of intuitive, right? You're a, you're a lawyer, if, if it's not about relationships, what is it? Well, in my industry, regrettably, uh, it can be about incremental billing of time. See, the traditional model is that you go to work and you make a phone call and that phone call lasted six minutes and there was value in that six minutes, so you record 0.1 of an hour and then ultimately bill based on that. Now, I don't mean to facetiously undermine what my colleagues do because there sometimes is value in those six minute conversations. But learning that I was motivated by relationships caused me to make three fundamental changes to what I was doing in half. First, I had to find an area, a, a method of law, a kind of law within my, within my possibilities that was primarily based on relationships. So I had two options. I could either be a family law lawyer or a criminal lawyer. And so of course I chose to be a criminal lawyer. I mean, that's the sexy law, right? That's, that's the stuff that uh, is really fun. And you know, after my first trial experience where my tears kind of washed the evidence away and my client went to jail, I quickly knew that that wasn't what I was meant to do. <laughs> Apparently, I'm told by the court clerks that the sobbing from me and the sobbing from my client were almost identical <laughs> as we greeted each other in the cells. I knew I had to find an area of law that I could work with people and it was primarily relationship based. So I started practicing in family law and my gosh was it ever immediately rewarding. I got to meet with clients whose um, need for, for advice, need for direction, uh, desire to change things were ultimately grounded in relationships which automatically put fuel in my tank. So the first thing is, I had to find my area of law, and I did. The second thing I had to do is I had to surround myself with people who approached it the same way I did. I knew that I wouldn't have success if I was part of a paradigm shift that was ultimately focused on, on dividing the day up in incremental portions of an hour. Right? I have 12 minutes to solve this problem. I knew I couldn't work in an environment like that. So eventually I built my team. Um, my team, you know, is, I have them today, and um, they're primarily motivated by and with relationships with others and with, and with me, which is really good. I wish they were here. Because <laughs> I think they'd say, really, we had a relationship today? I didn't see it. <laughs> The third thing I did, and this is I think where, what, I, what I want to share with you the most, 
The third thing is I did, I did is I entirely changed the way in which I perceived my work. Because if, if, if I was entirely motivated by relationships, that was my primary motivation, and it was really this natural fuel that caused me to do, do well and be motivated. If that was truly my fuel, I had to then change all of the ways I approached problems, all of the ways I constructed ideas based on relational thinking. And, and that relational thinking is goal-driven. What is it that we want to achieve? How is it that we're going to achieve it? What options do we see available? What tools do we have to create? Right? None of those are exactly legal questions. None of those have anything to do with evidence or procedure. But what they do is they cause you to think differently about your relationship with your, the person before you, your staff, the court, everyone around you. And that relational thinking has entirely transformed the way in which I approach almost every single part of my life. When I, I meet with my investment person, and I tell them, I want wind energy stock because it blows in Lethbridge and I'm going to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talk about maybe there's some other relationships we should explore, like reason. Um, <laughs> when, I meet, when, I, when I'm faced with different challenges in, or, or in owning a small business, when I'm faced with different time management challenges in having a career and managing a family, if I ultimately design a solution or approach the problem by way of relationships, by way of relational thinking, I can almost create a solution that's better than anyone could have created for me. So I'll give you an example. I'll have a client come to me in the face of crisis, in the face of their lives coming apart, and they say, Kristen, there's only one thing on the plate today. I need the house. I need to stay living in the house. You need to make sure I have the house. I don't know if you're hearing me. I need the house. I have to have the house, right? Their lives are thinking division of assets. They're thinking all these things. And I look at them and I say, why is it you think you need the house? And they look back at me like, what? I can't. How can you even ask that? We start exploring the actual relationship behind the demand, right? That house represents security. That house represents stability. That house represents certainty in the face of change. That's the relationship part. And if we start exploring that, understanding that, solu uh, so, uh, creating solutions on that, that's where we're going to see the movement. But that same logic, that relational thinking, if you get to that, in, in no matter what problem you have, no matter what career you have, no matter what parenting problem you have, that relation, relational thinking will enable you to get out of or into any solution you need. So that's what I'm, that, that really is my message. When I, when I ask you, you know, or when you ask, is money, you know, if money were no object, what would you do? I, I wouldn't do a lot different than I do now. I would do relational thinking. I would absolutely approach every single problem like, which car to wash in the driveway, <laughs> which house to go to, <laughs> based on those ultimate relationships. Because that, it's entirely transformed the way I approach my work. But where the true transformation comes is in the energy. There were days when I was in the old model, right? And I, my, I knew my day consisted of dividing an hour up into little increments that I could ultimately charge for that I would start my days with frozen cookie dough, Red Bull, Starbucks, and a cigarette. <laughs> that was my motivation, right? That's how I had to get going, and not always in that order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember going down the West Side Hill one morning, being so frustrated at like quarter after six, because that's how early you gotta get to work, right? A quarter after six, and I was like, why can't this person see I'm eating frozen cookie dough and I can't deploy my signal light? <laughs> My priorities are mixed up. <laughs> but you start changing your thinking, and if you, if you tap into your motivation, and you figure out what naturally fuels your tank, what you don't need that frozen cookie. Well, you still kind of need it sometimes. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, what naturally fuels you, you, you can't imagine how easy it is to achieve 
so much, so quick. So money will not be the object, it might be the result. And the process of getting there, when you figure out what motivates you, will be so easy. So contemplate that tonight. Figure out what motivates you. Some people might be the achievement of tasks. Other people might be the exploration of creativity. Other people might be um, the development of ideas, right? If that's what motivates you, translate that into every single decision you make or have it as your overall arching principle. And when you do, I'm quite certain success will follow. So that's it.